Thank you, Chris. It's so great to be here and to see this amazing turnout uh, for this event. It's such an honor to have this opportunity to address you, ASU English graduates, family, and friends. As a, the person chosen to represent the faculty and staff who've had the privilege of guiding you uh, to this proud moment of achievement and completion. I've been asked to talk to you for about 20 minutes, and I promise you that I'm not setting out to make your brain hurt today. Uh, I hope that we've done that very well over the past several years. <laughs> Uh, I hope that you're leaving here knowing how to pronounce a lot of names and words that you didn't know before and that most people cannot. I hope that you know epic means more than something that's super awesome. I hope that you're able to use words like hegemony, morpheme, and slush pile in a sentence. <laughs> Graduates, you are among 250 candidates completing bachelor's degrees in English this spring and summer, joined here too by our graduating English masters and doctoral candidates. Of course, English isn't one thing, but many. In our department, we further divided it into areas of specialization, creative writing, English education, film and media studies, literature, linguistics, and writing, rhetoric, and literacy. Some of you may affiliate more with one of these areas than another, but I hope that all of you identify at least to some degree with all of these parts of what we do, because we're definitely stronger in English studies when we stand together. We're made stronger still when we join forces with other units in the College's Humanities Division, including those in ASU's School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, in Jewish Studies, and in the School for International Letters and Cultures. We share a vision, all of us, of exploring, investigating, and considering the totality of human experiences recorded over time, some recorded better than others. <laughs> We faculty and staff have gotten to know you in classrooms, with and without desks and white whiteboards. Uh, you may be surprised to hear that half of our ASU English students now are enrolled in our online programs. Are there any of you here, by chance, who are graduating from an ASU online program? Wonderful, wonderful. Anybody who, this is your first time in this building. Wow, okay, amazing, and a special welcome to all of you because we know that it was probably harder for you to get here today than it was for many of us. Um, but I would also say that we know that all of you, family and friends, as well as graduates, have traveled far to come here, literally and figuratively. Whether you're new to this building or whether you already know every nook, cranny, and study space of it, you share a few things with those graduates sitting around you. What binds together English majors, English MAs, and English PhDs is our love for digging down into words and images and discovering and describing their power. Students, you express that love by taking classes on climate fiction and borderland poetry on phonology and morphology, and on the history of rhetorical theory, on environmental literary criticism, business writing, analyzing rhetoric and fake news, prison teaching, and Viking language and culture, to name just a few of the recent offerings in the department. You must have encountered some things that you never imagined existed. You may have encountered things you wish didn't exist. You may have encountered things that you hope you will never have to acknowledge the existence of again. <laughs> That's okay, we accept that. We hope that even the things you discover that you despise were formative on the sort of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger model. Uh, indeed, we recognize that the simple act of telling people your major probably made you stronger. We live in a moment when studying English is not as widely valued as it ought to be. Graduates, you're to be congratulated for choosing a major of great value that you've probably had to defend regularly. Now, for the benefit of those in the room who are not English majors, I need to clue you in on something. We know that you, we've made a choice that makes some of you uncomfortable, uh, that raises hackles or concerns or suspicions. We study language, we look for patterns. We've noticed that when we tell you we majored in English, what non-majors are likely to say to us starts to repeat. How many of you majors have heard this one? You're studying English, I hated English. <laughs> I'm still perfecting my response to that one, uh, but sometimes I go with, really, but you're so proficient. <laughs> uh -uh. 
And of course, there's this tired old classic, an English major, what are you gonna do with that? Or better, an English major, what are you gonna do with that, teach? <laughs> or how about this one, you're an English major? Uh-oh, I better watch my language around you. <laughs> As if the world's uh, English majors are the, uh, the scariest police officers of language imaginable, right? Okay, sir, step away from the vehicle and don't even dream of splitting another infinitive and tell you it's okay to move, right? <laughs> when you tell someone you're an English major, you're unlikely to get this response. You know, I just looked over a list of the world's famous people who are English majors, and it's so impressive. Or, bravo, the world really needs more English majors. But there are lots of us who know that to be true. I asked some of my smart, generous English major friends what words of wisdom they might have for you today. And 50 of them were moved to respond. Don't worry, I'm not going to read 50 people's answers. <laughs> but here are a few things that they said. Uh, my friend Meredith Musgrove Shaw wants me to tell you this about your future coworkers. The same people who talk about your worthless degree will be the first people to ask you to review their important emails and documents before they send them. <laughs> Carrie Shanafelt has this to say, I can't think of anything more important in confusing times than being able to think about how meaning and value are created so we can assert our own meaning and values, but also so we can understand how others are trading in meaning and values as if they are universal. Humanists study culture, study human culture. Other people think it's magic or timeless or even natural, but we know that it changes and that it can be changed. Curtis Perry writes, I am wearing a t-shirt today made by the ASU English graduate students group back in the day, 2004 or so, he says. It features a great quotation from Carolyn Heilbrunn. Power consists mostly in deciding what stories will be told. Very few people just fall into an English major, and most of you didn't select your course of study by accident or as a default option. This already says something important about you. It means you don't necessarily accept the status quo. You aren't, on the whole, happy with the first answer, or the expected answer to a question. You've demonstrated a willingness to pursue something out of the ordinary. People with these qualities are among those most likely to make a positive difference in the world, to make it a better and more interesting place, to look for solutions off the beaten path, to contribute in new ways, and to re-see possibilities. English majors are people who develop the courage of our convictions, backed up by research in well-crafted, well-documented, rhetoric rhetorically persuasive arguments, by moving stories, or in electrifying verse. Many of us study the language, images, and texts of the past in order to help us reflect on the present and the future, whether for groups we want to shine a spotlight on, or for ourselves as individuals, or both. My ASU English creative writing colleague, Tara Eisen, I know some of you have taken a class from Tara, did that in her memoir, Reeling Through Life, How I, lived, how, how, how I Learned to Live, Love, and Die at the Movies. Such a great title. I hope you'll read her book if you haven't already, and uh, because it's fabulous. And you know, maybe you should pick this up as the first book that you pick up for pleasure reading after you graduate. Uh, for me, it wasn't movies but literature, and one author in particular whose work shaped and propelled me forward positively, and that's Jane Austen. And I want to say a little bit about that with you today. I became attached to her fiction when I was a teenager. I studied her novels at the PhD level. I taught them, wrote books about her, feminism and her fame, married a fellow Jane Austen scholar, and played roller derby under a humorous send-up of her name, Stone Cold Jane Austen. <laughs> what I appreciate most about Austen's novels is how they are able to pose questions about how to live a meaningful life in a world that's often deeply unfair, or at least that's what they do for me and, and for many of us who return to them. But perhaps I also over-identify with Austen's lines about her heroine, Elizabeth Bennet, from the novel Pride and Prejudice. Elizabeth is said to have had a lively, playful disposition, with de which delighted in anything ridiculous. This line and others from Austen are on my mind now, because I've just finished a book of quotations called The Daily Jane Austen, which will be published in October. So maybe it's no surprise to think that, uh, to, to know that I'd think there's an Austen quotation that suits any and every occasion, and I want to quote a few for you. Uh, here's a line that I hope family members of graduates in the audience may take special pleasure in. It's from Austen's letters. 
Uh, she's traveling, but she takes a moment to write home to her sister. And she writes, I am sorry to tell you that I am getting very extravagant and spending all my money. And what is worse for you, I have been spending yours too. <laughs> And here's a quotation that goes out to my faculty friends from Austin's unfinished novel, The Watsons. Its heroine, Emma Watson, says, I would rather be a teacher at school, and I can think of nothing worse than marry a man I did not like. <laughs> so hearty congratulations to our English education graduates, and uh, happy Teacher Appreciation Week as well on that one. Uh, but to get serious again for a moment, Emma Watson's reflections are about what one rather would rather or rather not be, and they're fraught perhaps particularly for graduating English majors. I suspect many of you are tired not only of being asked, what are you going to do, teach, but even more bluntly, did you get a job? I get it. It's a practical economic question. I'm the mother of two teenage sons. Believe me, I very much want them to get full-time benefits eligible jobs someday because the alternative, alternative to that is that they do not get such jobs and this strikes fear into an aging parent's heart. But I also know that these questions are unsettling. I remember very vividly what it felt like to field them when I was at the stage in life that many of you are at. I was a first-generation college student from a family that wanted to count me among its success stories. And part of that success to them meant that I would get a different kind of job from the ones that others before me had held, especially the women before me. Now, no one knew exactly how I was supposed to do that. But the goal was that I wouldn't follow in the footsteps of three generations of women in my family. They had worked their butts off as house cleaners and laundresses for one wealthy family in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a background that I'm proud of that has made me especially sensitive to the people in the service industries. These are hard jobs. I know all of us know that. But I understand why my family wanted something else for me, a different plot, a different story and they were going to get me there through education. Beyond that, they didn't have a lot of ideas for me. <laughs> As I look back on it all, I now see turning points that I didn't recognize then in the arc of my own life story. One of them happened in my junior year of college when I got a phone call from one of my grandmother's bosses. She was one of those wealthy matriarchs with the houses that needed to be cleaned and the dirty laundry. Uh, that matriarch had a lot of agendas in that phone call to me, but one of them was to request that I come work for her. Her reasoning was, more or less, but your family works for my family. Luckily, my very smart grandmother had warned me that I was going to get this call. She told me that this woman did not like to take no for an answer and advised me to just keep saying no. She told me it was OK for me and for her to say no. I also that my best, decided that my best strategy was just to keep repeating the word college, you know, college, college, college. I thought maybe that would, that would be get through to her. You know, I was quiet and anxious in my 20s, and this was very hard for me. I see now that my grandmother was coaching me, despite the fact that very rarely in her own life did she feel she had the luxury of saying no to powerful people. As I look back on it, one of the things that she, both she and my English major together gave me was the ability and the courage to say no in increasingly sophisticated ways, in ways that powerful people might be more likely to listen to. It was around this time, too, that I first read Audre Lorde's 1978 essay, The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action. Some of you know this essay. I continue to reread it regularly because it inspires me, it inspires me to try harder and do better. The entirety of that essay is moving and important. Lord describes herself in that essay as a black lesbian warrior poet. She wrote it in middle age when she was facing a cancer diagnosis. And what she realizes, as she puts it, is if I was going to die, I was going to die sooner than later, whether or not I had ever spoken myself. She continues, my silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. And she calls on all of us to break our silences because, she says, there are so many silences to be broken. And it wasn't until many years later that I recognized that my grandmother was not only uh, reinforcing things that I read in Audre Lorde's essay, whom she'd never read. My grandmother had an eighth grade education. But she was also echoing scenes from a favorite book of mine. Uh, she was serving as a pride and prejudice like Mr. Bennett. And her wealthy employer was serving as a kind of Lady Catherine de Bourgh. 
<laughs> Those of you who have read the novel are laughing, but in that novel, in Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Bennett is the father who approves of his daughter's turning down an advantageous marriage proposal. It's remarkable that he validates her saying no, because the proposal comes from a man who would have secured the financial futures of his entire family, his wife and his four other daughters. It would have made it a lot easier if Elizabeth had just said yes. Yet Mr. Bennett validated Elizabeth's exercising her power of refusal. And later in the novel, when Lady Catherine de Bourgh is a selfish bully, Elizabeth again says no to her. Generations of people who've read Austen have understood these as significant moments of refusal and advocated for both individual self-determination and social change. And I'm really proud to have been able to bring some of them back into our historical record, including Rosina Filippi. Uh, she was an early dramatist who used Austen's novels for social change. But what these novels show us, what Felipe's duologues show us, what Lord's essay shows us, what my late grandmother showed me, is that even stories that stick with us may take some time to stick. I hope that what your work in English studies has taught you, is teaching you, and will continue to teach you, is that you need not just accept what's coming at you. Examine it. Question it, research it, document it, argue it, tell it to others. Use stories, language, and verse to shape possibilities for yourself and others. What comes next for you after graduation is not just a matter of getting a job or getting a job in your field. What comes next is continuing to build a life, which must involve making a living, yes, but which also involves discovering meaning and seeking growth, navigating and helping others navigate structures, and considering what you want to say no to as well as yes to. So maybe we shouldn't always be asking graduates, what are you going to do? Because we know in ASU English what you already do, that you already are, that you are beautifully becoming. Some 200 of you English majors every year hold internships that give us a glimpse into the kinds of career opportunities you might pursue next, the places where you might one day hold leadership roles. Sitting among you are social media content development interns at the Los Angeles Review of Books and the Phoenix Art Museum. You are editorial interns at DC Comics and Wired Magazine. You are language and culture interns at the US Department of State, the Gateway Community College Refugee Resettlement English Program, the San Diego Padres, and the Colorado Rockies. You are outreach interns at the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, American Indian Heritage interns at the Heard Museum, and public relations interns at the Sundance Film Festival. Again, these experiences point to career possibilities, and the paths to get there will not be smooth. I know you already know this. You know this because you've done the research. You know the stories. But being a graduate of ASU English is not just about attempting to chart out a straightforward path towards someone else's version of success or only what you want to do for a living. We recognize that you will couple these professional goals with things that you're seeking to be within your families and your communities, locally, nationally, globally. Do not be silent. And tell those of us who surround and support you how we might help you get there. You are graduating, yes. But faculty, staff, your fellow graduates, those around you, we are still here. We are here to help you reflect on when to say yes and no to prepare for life's tough phone calls, to recommend new books, to offer our stories and our wisdom and our connections. Educators are in the business of maximizing human potential. As humanists, we understand human potential as capaciously as possible. Dream things up, ask us for ideas, stay in touch, tell us how we can help you realize your vision inside and outside of whatever your first job or your next job might be. I want to close with one last Austin quotation. Uh, this one is from her Juvenalia, or her childhood writings, and it was written when she was about 17, which I think is remarkable. It's from a conversation between two teenage girls, Catherine and Camilla, who are discussing their mutual, fervid love of reading. Catherine tells her friend Camilla, for my own part, if a book is well written, I always find it too short. Camilla replies, so do I only I get tired of it before it is finished. <laughs> Graduate, whether the chapters of your life as a student at ASU English now seem to you to have been too short or tiring, tiringly long, this book is not yet closed. Our chosen shared commitment to describing, creating, and persuading in language, literature, film, history, and culture continues. We can't wait to see all you do next and what you don't do next. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.